when blood sugar drops, that's an energy crisis, right? We don't have enough of that reserve, enough of that fuel to draw from. And because of that, the body has these backup mechanisms. If we didn't have those, we'd be all, we all be dead. And, you know, when we have these backup mechanisms that ultimately keeps us alive because these stress hormones allow us to make carbohydrates from the stored fuel that we have in our bodies. So they almost in a way break down our body to fuel ourselves during these energy crises. So it will break down first, you know, liver glycogen, if we do have any, and liver glycogen is basically stored carbohydrates that we, that we have or should have. But, you know, say, for example, we're eating more of a lower carb diet for a long period of time, we might not have those available glycogen stores to draw from. And as a result, the body looks at the next best thing. So the next best thing might be breaking down body proteins or body fats to ultimately convert pieces of those into carbohydrates to raise that blood sugar back up. The, the problem with that is we're breaking down lean muscle and we're breaking down ourselves to ultimately fuel us throughout the day. And what ends up happening is you start losing, you know, some muscle tissue, right? And you start breaking down these fats, which over time, if that is carried out more chronically, we know that high amounts of fat in the blood can ultimately disrupt our ability to tolerate carbs. Welcome to The Body Never Lies. I'm your host, Leela Lutz. Each week, myself and experts from around the world help you uncover the secret ways your body communicates with you to empower you in your own individual health journey. So once upon a time, type 1 diabetes was known as something you were born with or developed as an infant or a young child. And type 2 diabetes was known as being the one you developed from being overweight, living the high fat, high sugar, processed food and sedentary lifestyle. But I'm seeing more and more that these are not the norms anymore. I have clients who don't eat bad food and are pre-diabetic. And I have clients with chronic blood sugar handling issues that have a myriad of health issues and all that's being prescribed to them is metformin. And as my guests will tell you, there are more and more young adults being diagnosed with type 1 later in life. My guest today, Isaac Polman, has a degree in physiology, a master's in nutritional science, and is a registered dietitian. But he also has type 1 diabetes and in the past had hypothyroidism, both of which he developed in college. Today, I want to ask him about his work specializing in people with blood sugar handling issues and insulin resistance, i.e. some people have these issues and don't have diabetes, and I'm going to talk about that why it's happening and what we can do about it rather than cutting out entire food groups from our diet and going on drugs that just cascade into needing more and more drugs. Oh, I'm so excited, Isaac Polman, to have you on the show today to talk all things diabetes, type 1, type 2, insulin resistance, all that stuff. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, I really appreciate the invite, Leila. It's wonderful to, to be on with you here. So let's start. I want to start a little bit about your journey because you have an interesting story, right? Because you yourself are a, you're you're an amazing coach, but you also have type one diabetes. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. And I can kind of delve into my story because it didn't really necessarily start with diabetes for me, um, and started really early in, in high school, actually, where. Um, you know, I was a, a, as an athlete in high school and kind of, uh, was, uh, accustomed to really working out hard, training hard. And that really got the best of me as maybe a lot of people here can understand or relate to if you've been involved with sports. And, uh, at that time I really was overdoing it over training. And that led to a lot of symptoms for me, chronic fatigue, uh, gastroparesis, and, uh, was something that uh, really took the place very early for me and I didn't really get a lot of guidance for early on. So it was kind of this overwhelming experience where I really didn't know what to do with it. And that kind of existed until college where it got even worse because I was playing, um, varsity soccer in college as well and ended up having to quit actually because of some of those debilitating symptoms. And at that time too, it was a really an identity loss for me because I so much resonated with being an athlete and playing soccer, but um, I really had to make that, make that switch because I really wasn't supporting my health in the best way possible. And um, while the doctors I met with, and I met with numerous of them, I can't even count on how many I met with, they 
they really um, weren't the best resource for me. And while well-meaning, I just really, at that time, I understood I needed to take it into my own hands and really advocate for myself and started to really dive in. And the more and more I got into it, the more curious I got. And um, while that was a really difficult time frame for me, uh, I think it really formed the foundation of how I work with clients to this day, right? And um, at that point too, another kind of wrench got thrown into it where I had got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So that was in addition to the fatigue and um, all the hormonal imbalances that I was kind of working through, that was just kind of another sort of wrench thrown in that I was trying to navigate on my own there. So. Uh, uh, so yeah, I got introduced to it early and, um, you know, there are obstacles, challenges, but it really formed the way I practice and work with people to this day. And how about your um, coaching journey as your, you know, your professional um, journey? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so ab- absolutely. So I, I actually went on to... Um, After my undergrad experience, which was very much rooted in human physiology, which is like a a, a degree that you can use for like medical school or uh, physical therapy, physician's assistant, that kind of thing. Um, So I had that foundation of, hey, how the body works here. And then I went on to graduate school where I really studied nutritional sciences, um, more specialized and at, at the University of Michigan. So really worked on, on that, learning more about macronutrients and micronutrients and impact on the body. And, um, you know, after that training, I, I went on to get my uh, license as a dietitian as well, went through this kind of year long internship, uh, similar to kind of like a, what a doctor would do with like a residency, just a little bit shorter. Um, and, um, you know, that was something I took pride in, but I think the more, one of the more things that I actually thought was really helpful for me was the self-discovery, independent research, uh, reading up on books, things like, um, you know, from Ray Pete, Broda Barnes, and then actually getting mentorship with a, a friend, colleague that I continue to chat with today by the name of Josh Rubin. Uh, I think you're familiar with, mm-hmm. with him as well. Um, yeah, he's been a great resource for me. And I actually worked with him for a good solid year uh, during that time too, where I was trying to navigate that on my own and just felt like his mentorship was super uh, helpful when it came to me ultimately feeling better. So that was a big thing for me, getting uh, you know mentorship, reading, uh, self-discovery trainings, and really experimenting on myself, which allowed me to uh, really uh, help and support clients that I work with to this day, which tend to be those that are dealing with some level of blood sugar issue, whether that be a, you know individuals with type one diabetes, uh, you know type two prediabetes, insulin resistance, that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, that that self-discovery mentorship really played a huge role for me something I can't really stress enough to coaches and um, I always think the best coaches and have walked the path of being the client um, because it's one thing to like do something for yourself and learn something yourself and apply it to yourself and then put that out as a package for client stuff but to actually be coached by someone else and have to show up every day with your food logs and your attempts and pulse and all that sort of stuff it's you really gain a wisdom that you wouldn't get otherwise for your practice I really encourage all coaches to go and get coaching by someone else and I think that really makes you a great coach is having that experience of being the client So, yeah, Josh is amazing. He's been on the show a few times before. If you guys want to go back and listen to his episodes, a great mentor of mine as well. But let's get into diabetes. So, like you say, you work with all areas of diabetes. So for everyone listening, we're going to to cover all the blood sugar handling issues. So you're going to love this episode if you've been told you're pre-diabetic, you're type 1, type 2, or you have blood sugar handling issues. Just in general, you're you're going to really like this episode. So... I guess I want to start with what, what is diabetes? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. What is diabetes? Well, you know, when it comes to any sort of diabetes, wherever that spectrum falls for you, whether that's type one, type two, or, you know, they have a, a, a spectrum now where they call it like late onset diabetes as well. But if we kind of stick with the main categories, type one, type two, it's, it's more so an inability to process carbohydrates. And a lot of times we're, we're thinking of, oh, well, you know, it's the, it's the carbs that are the problem. And to some extent that could be the case, but 
but you know, there's always some underlying reasons as to why we're not able to properly use and um, take in carbohydrates as fuel, right? It can be for you know, type one, maybe it's an insulin resist or uh, insulin deficiency issue, or, you know, maybe it's, you know, things like a lack of sleep or, you know, excess stress or uh, lack of movement or, you know, high fat diets, which really underlie our ability to ultimately process those carbohydrates and turn them into fuel. So at this, the core of diabetes, no matter where you kind of fall in that spectrum, it's just that inability to use those carbohydrates at, for fuel. And uh, it's not just about the carbs, it's about some of those underlying factors, uh, like the uh, macro micronutrient balance, as well as, you know, lifestyle factors as well. Okay, cool. And then so was a really good co cover of that. So what would be, I guess, then I guess, how we explain blood sugar handling to people? Because I think people think of like, oh, you just test your blood sugars and whether your blood sugar is good or not, you know, it's quite a loose term. I'd love you to explain that a bit more in depth. Yeah. Yeah. And I always like to explain like blood sugar balance or blood sugar handling kind of like this. So if you think about like a car and a car's primary energy source, at least, you know, some of the cars these days are, are fueled with gas, right? That's their primary fuel source. And that's kind of the same thing for blood sugar. It's this resource that we pull from to ultimately feel our best. And when that is disrupted, it's almost in a sense, a threat to our survival, just as if we didn't have enough gas in our car, we wouldn't, able to, we wouldn't be able to get from point A to point B, right? So when we don't have that balanced blood sugar, what ends up happening is it's, it's a threat to our body. It's a threat to our survival because if blood sugar tanks and it's at a zero, we're, we're dead. We're not alive. We're not living. So anytime that that's disrupted, whether it goes too high or whether it goes too low, that can be a threat to our survival and that can increase stress hormones in a way. And when stress increases, especially if this is more of a chronic nature, symptoms tend to come about. So I, I like to also give the example of if the audience has seen like the Snickers commercials, they often say, hey, you're not you when you're hungry. Well, that's kind of the same thing for blood sugar. You're also not you when your blood sugar is out of balance, right? When it's too low, you tend to feel uh, more dizzy, more lightheaded, uh, irritable, hangry types of feelings, anxious versus if your blood sugar is high, you tend to feel a little bit more lethargic, uh, excess thirst, frequent urination, um, you know, numbness, tingling, itchy skin. So there's a lot of things that go into blood sugar balance that not always are reg um, can be uh, measured by with blood sugar, but also with symptoms and are not just specific for those with diabetes, you know, balancing blood sugar can play a big role when it comes to any person. And whenever that blood sugar is in more balance, you're going to feel better. You're going to be feeling feeling better mentally and physically more lasting energy. You're going to be in a better mood. You're going to be able to handle stress a lot better. You're going to be more resilient, you know, less food cravings as well. So just feeling better overall when that is in balance because we are energy beings and because that is such a primary fuel source that our body functions on. Mm, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you have so, because I think we're so conditioned to not eat because eating can make, if you, you know, food equals weight gain. So if you are not eating, you're not gaining weight and so that's okay. And then not understanding that you're, when you're not eating, your blood sugar drops and how bad that is for your health. And then what goes down must come up <laughs> right so exactly what happens in terms of stress hormones when our blood sugar drops too low because i'm seeing more and more people living on low blood like constant low blood sugar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what happens when your blood sugar drops too low what's the physiological response in terms of stress hormones and things yeah. Yeah. So when the blood sugar drops low and, and typically low would be defined as less than less than 70 um, if you're monitoring from American um, standpoint. So uh, when blood sugar drops, that's an energy crisis, right? We don't have enough of that reserve, enough of that fuel to draw from. And because of that, the body has these backup mechanisms. If we didn't have those, we'd be all, we all be dead. 
And, you know, when we have these backup mechanisms, that ultimately keeps us alive because these stress hormones allow us to make carbohydrates from the stored fuel that we have in our bodies. So they almost in a way break down our body to fuel ourselves during these energy crises. So it will break down first, you know, liver glycogen, if we do have any, and liver glycogen is basically stored carbohydrates that we, that we have or should have. But, you know, say, for example, we're eating more of a lower carb diet for a long period of time, we might not have those available glycogen stores to draw from. And as a result, the body looks at the next best thing. So the next best thing might be breaking down body proteins or body fats to ultimately convert pieces of those into carbohydrates to raise that blood sugar back up. The, the problem with that is we're breaking down lean muscle and we're breaking down ourselves to ultimately fuel us throughout the day. And what ends up happening is you start losing, you know, some muscle tissue, right? And you start breaking down these fats, which over time, if that is carried out more chronically, we know that high amounts of fat in the blood can ultimately disrupt our ability to tolerate carbs. So what I find in, in working with people, I get a lot of folks that are coming from this uh, lower carb ketogenic background, yet their blood blood sugars are continuing to rise. And that's part of the issue is that they're breaking down a lot of these fats that are ultimately contributing to some level of insulin resistance. And it's making hard, it harder to ultimately uh, process those carbohydrates. Mm, and you become like carbohydrate intolerant, don't you? So when you reintroduce carbs after being low carb, can you explain a little bit? Because a lot of these people go, but no, I tried some carbs and now I feel awful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And, and this is one of the mistakes that I actually made too, going back to my health history and, and many of the clients that I see is, is going too fast, mm -hmm. right? You know, you, it's, it's all about practice. And, and if you were to even look at a profession outside of, of just nutrition, you know, if you were wanting to become a, a basketball player, you wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to play high school basketball and all the way jump to the NBA. I mean, there's some people that can do that, but not for the good percentage. And that's the same thing when it comes to carbohydrates. We think that, hey, we're going to eat lower carb and go all the way up to moderate carb or I'll go all the way up to high carb. And what ends up happening while that might be supportive in the long run, that's probably not supportive where you are. So it's all about meeting yourself where you are right now, because you just don't have that mineral balance in place. You don't have that machinery. Your body's not used to practicing in that sort of manner with carbohydrates that you do have on board because it's been so used to getting proteins and uh, fats for fuel, right? So it takes a period of time of adjustment and it's, it's all about meeting you where you are. So if you are eating ketogenic, uh, ketogenic diet, maybe it's adding one carb per day, right? It's not going, oh, I'm going to have a moderate carb diet or hard, high carb diet. That's just kind of asking for a lot of symptoms to develop. And I see that happening for those that are really um, struggling with that. They, they just kind of tend to go too fast or, you know, they might not be eating the, the ultimately the supportive carbs there for you because, Ultimately, there's a difference between something like, you know, a, a bowl of cereal or oatmeal or rice versus fruit or root veggies or squash, right? There's differences between those carbohydrate sources that can ultimately make the difference in how you feel. Yeah, we're going to come back to that part when we get specific with the food. But I think this is also why a lot of people say they put on a lot of weight when they, you know, stop these low carb diets and move to a, what we would call a pro metabolic kind of way of eating. They're putting on lots and lots of weight from going too fast and just all of a sudden eating a lot more calories than they used to eat. Um, so in, and then we have insulin. So can you explain insulin to us? Yeah, absolutely. So insulin kind of goes hand in hand with, with blood sugar. So whenever we eat something and it, and it can be, uh, you know, lower in carbs too, but whenever we eat something, there is some semblance of insulin release, uh, you know, with the exception of someone with like type one diabetes, who just doesn't have that ability to do so. But, you know, let's, you know, with, with that being an exception for, for the rest of those that don't have type one or don't have that insulin deficiency, insulin is, is released ultimately whenever you are eating something and particularly in response to a carbohydrate. So 
the body senses when blood sugar is rising and the adapting machine that it is, it, it adjusts, it secretes more insulin to ultimately keep that blood sugar within balance. So ultimately we're feeling as well as, as possible, right? And what that insulin does is it takes those carbohydrates from the bloodstream, right? And it delivers them to the cells. So ultimately we can use and create energy out of them. And that's a big reason why when blood sugar imbalances occur, when we're not able to take that, those carbohydrates from the bloodstream to the cells that a lot of us might experience some energy issues because we're just not getting that proper fuel and carbohydrates being the prime fuel source for the body. You can, you can imagine how that could create some fatigue, some energy issues there too, especially for those that are maybe experiencing the blood sugar imbalances or just not eating carbs in general. So we can have trouble with insulin resistance in all types of people, not just diabetics. Um, would you explain in insulin resistance to us? Yeah, absolutely. So when it, when it comes to insulin resistance, and it, it's kind of like a, a, a two-part process, if you will. So um, we know there's kind of an initial period of time where maybe blood sugar rises a bit and those can be due to maybe some lifestyle factors. And typically it's not just one thing, you know, there's all sorts of things that can contribute to some higher blood sugars there, but let's, let's say, you know, it could be sleep. So you're not getting enough sleep. Maybe you're experiencing a lot of stress at work or, or at home. Um, you know, maybe you're not moving in a way that you'd like to maybe have a desk job and ultimately not, not uh, getting enough uh, of that movement. And maybe your diet is a little bit in balance. So maybe you're consuming, um, you know, a lot of you know, excess carbohydrates, maybe not enough protein, maybe not enough of the supportive fats and blood sugar rises, right? And what happens as a result of blood sugar rising is that we secrete more of the insulin, right? To kind of keep things in balance. Uh, again, going back to that blood sugar balance theme. And when that happens, let's say this, these patterns continue over the course of time. Well, if, if those really continue, blood sugar is con continue going to you know, rise. And as a result, insulin is going to be released as, as a result of that. And when that becomes more and more chronic and insulin can rise, you know, out of range. And what what typically happens is when insulin rises out of range and we get too much, it in a way it overwhelms the cell and it doesn't respond in the same way. In other words, it kind of desensitizes it. And as a result, that insulin that we once were able to utilize properly and um, help us to kind of regulate that blood sugar, it all of a sudden doesn't work as well. And as a result, that blood sugar tends to rise and again, and, uh, you know, over time that can contribute to some prediabetes type two diabetes, for example. Right. But in those initial periods, we have a lot of insulin going around. So for some people that can lead to lower blood sugars, actually some hypoglycemia. And then as that progresses more of that insulin resistance, we're not just able to utilize that because the cell is so overwhelmed with the amount of insulin that is available. And you can see that with any, almost any other hormone too. If you talk about thyroid hormone as well, um, you know, if we have too much thyroid hormone going around, there's something called thyroid resistance. So, you know, there's, there's hormone resistance where we're just not able to use it properly. And that's what typically leads to that insulin resistance that we talk about there. And that can be an interesting one with blood tests, right? Because you can, for instance, have a, a lot of thyroid in your blood and it come under the normal guise of blood tests, but then told you don't have a thyroid problem, but then you have all of these symptoms and it's the things that we can't test, like what's happening at the cell level. And we had another episode with Tomo on that one about blood tests and how we need to use them. So I'm glad you brought that up. So then how do we test? Well, I think, We'll come back to that because we need to explain insulin in terms of type 1 diabetes. Sure. We'll come back to testing in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So th there's a difference between different types of diabetes. So with, with type one, it's autoimmune in origin and the immune system takes out kind of the defective cells, which are tend to be concentrated in that uh, pancreas area for those of us that do have type one. So when those beta cells, as they're called, those insulin secreting beta cells are taken out, what ends up happening is we 
don't secrete as much insulin. And as a result, that blood sugar tends to rise, right? So we're not able to, to uh, have the insulin to take it from the, the, the carbohydrates from the bloodstream to the cells. And as a result, you need to supplement with something like insulin. So that's what I take. I take um, what's called Novolog and Basaglars, which are two forms of insulins that really help to regulate my level. So I ultimately feel the best that I can day in and day out, right? And again, when those levels are thrown off, then and you you do start to feel very poorly physically, right? So that's more of an insulin deficiency. The type two is more so that insulin resistance that we talked about. So that's kind of the origin. And with insulin resistance, that can do be due to that excess insulin, of course, but the uh, contributing factors to that can be you know, things like sleep and stress and uh, macro balance and micronutrient imbalances. Things like iron can be uh, play a big role in that as well. So there's a lot of you know different pieces. Again, it's not just one, but either way, that origin is more so that insulin resistance so, um, you know, for those of with type two, especially as a result of that insulin resistance, they tend to secrete a lot of glucose from the liver. So their their liver is putting out a lot of glucose. And typically the, um, the prescription for someone with type two is something like metformin, which actually negates that, um, that liver uh, glucose output, right? So um, metformin is typically used in that circumstances. And, you know, that's probably not the, the most ideal. I mean, there's some side effects that we can get into today, but that's, that's one of the reasons why um, type twos do see an increase in blood sugar is that insulin resistance, and then their liver is putting out extra glucose into the bloodstream as well. Well, let's talk about some of the testing now for how you diagnose diabetes. So there's two tests in Australia that I know of and most people would know of. The glucose tolerance test where you drink, I think it's, what is it, 75 grams of carbohydrate on its own in a juice, in a liquid form, and then you have to sit there for a couple of hours and they'll take your bloods and they make you do it when you're pregnant. And I got out of it when I was pregnant <laughs> and you might explain <laughs> you might explain why I did. it's not a test I wanted to do and the HbA1c test so um, and there's probably some others that they do as well but maybe we'll just start with the glucose tolerance test yeah absolutely yeah, and the, the glucose tolerance test I, I think you know it can be a, a good measure of things I don't necessarily think it actually estimates real life, you know, um, I don't know, because in real life, you know, you might have some protein, you might have some fat with that, that meal. Um, so, you know, with the glucose tolerance test, what they're giving you, like you said, Layla is a form of, uh, glucose solution, very, uh, concentrated about that 75 grams. And you, you take that and then they measure your blood sugar level about two hours afterwards. And if there is a challenge with blood sugar, typically that number is going to be more than 140 uh, for us Americans. And then for um, those of us that use millimoles over 7.8. So that can be, a, 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 I don't want to say maybe a nice way, but just a barometer of where that kind of blood sugar or your ability to tolerate carbohydrates really stands there for you. Typically, they what they will do is take a fasting blood sugar before this test to confirm whether you do have a blood sugar challenge and ultimately confirm it with something like a oral glucose tolerance test like this. And if it's over 200, that would potentially indicate a diabetes diagnosis. And uh, what they like to do is, is take that test, glucose tolerance, a fasting blood sugar, and in my experience, they like to take an A1C as well. So the hemoglobin A1C is another test that they confirm and really just shows you the average of where your blood sugar has been over the course of the last three months, right? And if it's between 5.7 and 6.4, that would indicate a prediabetes. So just before uh, a diabetes diagnosis, and then anything over 6.4 would be that, that diabetes diagnosis type two, right? And type one as well. So that's what they would use as that barometer. For those with type one, um, there is a slight difference. They would also uh, test antibodies as well. The one that um, I received was called the GAD65 
uh, antibody test, and that tested positive. So for those of us to to um, to uh, test for that type one, there is that autoimmune, the antibody test that also is included with that to make that type one diagnosis as well. Mm. It's a how, but how do you feel about the test? Do you feel like they're accurate enough for like giving us a true picture? Because one of the issues that I had with doing that glucose tolerance test is that I get up at six in the morning and then I wouldn't be able to have the test until after 9 a.m. So it's three hours of no food while I'm up doing stuff. And then yeah. to go and have 75 grams of glucose just on its own, which I would never do. And the doctor, when I was talking to the obstetrician, he said, well, it would just be like if you went to a party and you had too much cake and a little too much champagne. And I was like, do you want me to do that when I'm pregnant? And he was like, well, not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my opinion, I don't really like the glucose tolerance test because, like I said, I don't think it simulates real life. And mm -hmm. um, even if you are drinking, for example, a soda with a lot of concentrated sugar, typically someone is going to be eating something with that too, mm -hmm. or might have something close by. So again, I don't know if it simulates real life, but um, it, it's a test nonetheless. I ultimately um, like to look at maybe other measures in addition to that, but for that one, um, not, not so sure. With, with the A1C though too, it's not showing those ups and downs in blood sugar as well. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's pros and cons with each of these tests. No test is really perfect. But with the A1C, again, it's showing that average of where that blood sugar has been, but it doesn't capture those daily, those ups and downs that you might have, those roller coaster blood sugars, right? So even with the A1C, it isn't necessarily the most accurate in terms of capturing those day-to-day -day measures. Um, for those that, and this is not something that we mentioned yet, but I wear something called a continuous glucose monitor and that monitor is kind of your time and range. And this wasn't, wouldn't be something I would recommend for everybody, but as per, especially for those that are on some type of insulin or have type one diabetes, that can be helpful because it's tracking the amount of time that you're spending in that target range, right? So that can give you a better picture versus the A1C, which is just the average and doesn't show those ups and downs. Mm, yeah, it's interesting because I had the A1C, but I've always been a person that suffers from low blood sugar and I have autoimmune Hashimoto's, which we can probably talk about because one of the things I was always told when every endocrinologist I said was that I had such a high level of antibodies that I was likely to develop type 1 diabetes as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do say that quite a bit, you know, with any sort of autoimmune condition, sometimes they do come in pairs. So I have clients that have like celiac disease, for example, and not able to tolerate gluten. Um, as you mentioned, I have a few clients that also have uh, Hashimoto, so the autoimmune form of, of hypothyroidism. So it, you know, sometimes those do actually come in pairs and they, that was something that they tested for me there as well was uh, uh, antibodies to the, the thyroid because of that association. Mm, yeah, I have celiac disease too. So it'd be good to come back and talk about why that is, that autoimmune cascade. Because of course, one of the things everybody thinks when they have autoimmune is they should give up sugar because sugar is bad for your immune system. <laughs> Right. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And, uh, you know, carbohydrates are, uh, are a hot topic these days and there's all sorts of protocols created to avoid them. But in a sense, you know, if we go back to physiology there in any uh, good human physiology textbook is going to say glucose is the prime energy source for the body and any good study will, will say that as well. And that's, an, that's important because carbohydrates to some extent, they are needed to support things like thyroid health. And with thyroid health, it ultimately impacts every single cell in the body. Broda Barnes was so influential if, if uh, the listeners are familiar with him as well. And when you think about every single cell in the body, that's a lot of different areas of the body. That's a lot of different functions from your mental and physical health and energy and even things like blood sugar as well. So do you think thyroid is more of a precursor to diabetes? It, it, it certainly can be. And, and Broda Barnes wrote about that too, mm -hmm. where he was experiencing um, some uh, clients that had um, prediabetes. And as a result of 
giving them thyroid, their blood sugar normalized. So that's not, that's not necessarily me take it selling people, hey, you need just need to take thyroid and all, all things are, are are well and good. But it's just kind of looking at maybe the lifestyle factors that could be contributing to that thyroid imbalance. So you can ultimately get that um, going and that as a domino effect as a result can help to support the, the blood sugar too. I've certainly seen that with myself and with a lot of clients, like having blood sugar issues, doing all the right things with food and need, then needing some thyroid hormone and then not no longer having blood sugar issues pre-diabetes, you know, or easing of type 1 diabetes. So then let's have a, I mean, how does insulin like when you take Medicaid insulin, is that a set dose to you? Is that like the doctor said to you for life, you need this dose? Is there anything that you can do to influence that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is a hot topic and a question I get quite a bit. And, um, you know, when it comes to like the dosing of insulin, that, that can be something that changes over time, especially as you kind of get older for, for those that are typically diagnosed with type one, it's something that uh, is kind of termed the juvenile diabetes, meaning that it's tend to be diagnosed when you are younger, but that's not always the case either. Um, But, you know, as you you get older, sometimes if, um, if diet or lifestyle isn't quite as supportive, uh, type one diabetes can start to look a little bit more similar to something like type two. So they might tend to experience a little bit more insulin resistance. And as a result, their insulin dosages may need to go up and, or they might be prescribed other medications to ultimately regulate that too. So with those dosages, that's something that can, can change, especially, um, upon when you're first diagnosed with type one, um, you might be very insulin sensitive at that time. But when you, whenever you're taking any sort of hormone, this is kind of important to understand too, that your body will just naturally not produce as much. And that's the same thing with, with, you know, if you look at thyroid too, or any form of supplemental hormone, I was on testosterone therapy for a time too, but it makes your body almost lazy in a sense. So it, it's almost a catch 22. Well, you need insulin, but it's going to downregulate your ability to produce that a little bit too. So over time, dosages do tend to increase partly because of that, mm-hmm. but also if your lifestyle isn't set up in accordance to what is supportive for you, sometimes Times that insulin resistance can uh, can tend to increase there. So, can you use diet to influence how much you rely on injecting yourself with insulin? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. And uh, partly it can be due to maybe uh, the the meal balance that you have. It can be partly due to uh, the kinds of carbohydrates that you are taking in, Um, you know, lifestyle, things like sleep. Sleep can, if you're not getting the appropriate amounts of sleep, it can increase insulin resistance. I just saw a study by up to like 80%. So there's these underlying factors that if you do have those in place and they're ultimately supportive, it can make it a little bit easier to manage even things like type one diabetes. Now, you know, I I will say, you know, while there's things that you can do, I haven't seen enough evidence that there's, that you can kind of get off of insulin. You know, there's, there's mice, mice studies that indicate, oh, you can regenerate beta cells. Um, through, you know, various things, but um, I just haven't seen enough, especially human studies to be able to, to look at that. But that doesn't mean you can't make it easier to living in a way that's ultimately supportive. And that goes back to diet and stress and sleep and, and movement throughout the day that can be very supportive to the amount of insulin that you have to take. That's interesting too, because Jay Feldman was talking about when my studies and rat studies is that we need so much more glucose in comparison to a rat, a mouse or a rat because we have such bigger brains. So sometimes those studies are not um, indicative of enough of how we would actually work with glucose and sugars and things. So what about with, um, sorry, what about with metformin? Because like we said before, that is so often and easily prescribed and I'm finding it I'm finding it very over prescribed in my opinion metformin um, how does it work and what are the side effects yeah absolutely so yeah metformin is, is pretty typically at least in the U.S. here the go-to when it comes to managing type type 2 diabetes and the actions that it uh, it basically gets at is that liver that's putting out the extra oops, the extra glucose into the bloodstream. And, 
as a result, it regulates the output. It decreases a process called gluconeogenesis. If your your um, listeners are familiar with that, where it's putting out all these carbohydrates, so it reduces that process, and as a result, blood sugar tolerance improves. the The problem with metformin is what it does, and you can find this in studies too. It depletes the body of something called copper, which is this mineral that's very influential in metabolism, very influential in ultimately your ability to tolerate carbohydrates at the end of the day. So over time, I see when someone is on metformin, it really uh, plays a big role, a negative role in their metabolism and uh, tends to be where they kind of need more and more metformin over time in order to sustain that balanced blood sugar level, right? So that's what I typically see. And I I believe part of that is probably due to metformin's ability to deplete that copper, which is uh, already deficient in a lot of, especially here in America, where we have so much iron fortification and copper rich foods aren't something that are practiced traditionally here, uh, especially in my generation. So uh, that can be one of the main issues when it does come to metformin. And in my opinion, isn't really addressing kind of the root cause, because when we think about excess gluconeogenesis, typically some of the root contributors behind that just through through research that I've seen can be um, excess of iron stored away Mm -hmm. Or something called lipid peroxidation, which basically just means a lot of unsaturated fats, which are causing a level of inflammation in the body there as well. So those two components. And then, of course, metformin is kind of the uh, uh, gas on the fire, so to speak, because it's it's um, chelating, it's depleting us of the, the very mineral that would be helpful in regulating those, those two uh, processes. Mm. And there's, yes, yeah, so many diets that are de- deficient in copper, vegan diets, vegetarian diets, you know, even paleo diets and every, they can all be deficient in copper, um, especially grain-based diets, standard American diet. So it's interesting, right, because I'll often have someone came, come to me and say, but I'm healthy and I'm, you know, I eat, cr- cr- I eat clean, but I have been told that I have uh, type two diabetes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, um, it's, it's, uh, it's easy to kind of generalize of, 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 um, eating clean or, you know, there, there's a, a different definition that I think each person kind of has with that, or what, what does clean eating mean? Does it mean you're washing your produce or, you know, um, so I, I think each of us relates to that different, but I think this is where the specifics are super important and having some level of knowledge. It doesn't mean you have to have the same knowledge as maybe someone like you, Layla, or someone like me, but just having a general sense of maybe some of those minerals that are ultimately supportive and some of those foods that are ultimately supportive for you. And that part of that is maybe advocating for yourself. I think that's such a big thing nowadays because we view maybe doctors or other health professionals as that authority figure and just take their word at it. But I think with my experience, personal experience and professional, that often does people a disservice because it doesn't enhance their ability to really advocate for themselves and create their own vision of, of health and own journey of health instead of just relying on somebody else to do that for them. So really looking into more of the specifics of, um, you know, what does clean eating really mean? And then looking at kind of the macronutrient, micronutrient balance, as well as lifestyle factors beyond that. And, and part of that can be, you know, listening to, of course, podcasts like this to gain that information or working with a great coach such as yourself um, and, uh, you know, learning more about that, bouncing ideas, getting feedback on uh, food logs or what that means, because sometimes we're too close to the problem. We can't kind of see out of it. And that's what was so helpful for me working with Josh and being able to see that, oh, wait, you know, there's a lot of holes here that are probably make uh, ultimately making the difference between me not feeling well and ultimately seeing some progress here. You're so, you're so right. I think it's um, even like, like myself as a coach, like I need, like at the moment I'm trying to do weight loss. And so sometimes I can get too stuck in my own head. Like, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do a surplus? Should I do muscle gains? Should I, what should I do? So I call Libby Westcombe and we do a game plan, you know, because you need someone outside of yourself who's not close to the problem to go, let's just strategize it and implement some things. And I think because ultimately 
even a coach can have an idea of how what might be a good idea, right? But we never actually know how it's going to respond. The client's going to respond until we take data and test. And, you know, so I might eat a different amount of carbohydrate than you do. And I might eat a different amount of protein than you do. So if you said, I said, oh, Isaac, I've got, um, I've got Hashimoto's and my doctor told me that I'm at very high risk of getting type one diabetes. And you say, well, I have that. So here's what I do. You just do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. But we all have our own health journey and ultimately what's going to be supportive for someone like me may not be for you. And I think that's that often creates some confusion because I don't think the specifics were able to kind of uh, capture that over the social media. And so people might be confused upon, Hey, I thought you said this on social media, but you said this other thing during our coaching call. And and sometimes that can create like just a level of confusion that, uh, you know, who is right here? Who do I follow? But at the end of the day, that experimentation, as you said, can make such a big difference. And, uh, and of course, having that guided, uh, um, experimentation, I think it can really accelerate some things for you. So as you mentioned, working with Libby or, or someone who might have a perspective other than yourself, no matter how intelligent you might be or how much training that you might have, just another set of eyes on that can make a difference for even of us that have more of that advanced training or know, know some things because, um, you know, just, just having some guidance, even for, even for, for us can make a, a world of difference. And that's one of the reasons why I reached out to Josh and uh, wanted to get his perspective on things. So absolutely. Those, those mentors, those another set of eyes can make all the world of difference. Hundred mm, percent. So let's talk about the liver because I think it's important to understand the liver's role mm. in blood sugar. And we did have a whole episode on the liver with Jay Feldman, so we, you know we touched on that a little bit. But can we talk a little bit about the liver just to understand how it relates to diabetes and blood sugar handling? Yeah, absolutely. So the liver can be such an important piece when it comes to blood sugar, because it's almost this backup system that we talked about. So when stress increases, uh, you know, the uh, glycogen, the stored glycogen that we have in our liver is ultimately released. And that allows us to survive that energy crisis that we talked about before. So the liver is so key and ultimately our survival and blood sugar balance to make sure that we aren't dropping too low so that it can be uh, just a, make a world of difference. Uh, I, I will say if you are eating more so a low carb diet or more of a chronic low carb, um, typically you're not going to have as much stored glycogen away. And the thing about the liver is it's a prime site for the activation of thyroid hormone. And to ultimately activate it, you need that fuel coming in the form of carbohydrates. And that that's not to say that you need a ton of them. It doesn't mean you need hard carb diet, but you need some coming in that allows for that activation of thyroid hormone. And that occurs uh, in the liver, right? That's a primary site for that. And we know that when thyroid hormone is activated, it increases metabolism, it increases our ability to use those carbohydrates for fuel. And as a result, that blood sugar generally falls into place as a result of that. So there's these domino pieces from the liver to the thyroid to the blood sugar that are all connected. But if you don't kind of understand that pathway, it can be difficult to think of, wait, how is the liver related to blood sugar balance here? So that is certainly a a big player. And you, you touched on the, the metformin below um, or before and with the liver, when we have, you know, a micronutrient imbalance, so we're, we have too much iron stored away, or we have a history of consuming a lot of vegetable oils and have a lot of inflammation uh, going on there, um, the liver can actually become insulin resistant and uh, contribute to that excess release of glucose. You know, it's, it's helpful when it's released in balance, right. To regulate those lows that we might come across, but when it's in excess, that's where things like the type two diabetes can come into play. And that's why the metformin people see some benefits with that because it's reducing that excess release of glucose. So that can be another way that the liver might play an adverse role if you know we have those micronutrient imbalances, eating foods fortified in iron or a high in uh, excess um, in unsaturated fats and just not enough uh, copper, for example. Mm. 
Such a good explanation. Thank you. So I guess the first thing that we talk about when you get told that you have especially type 1 is to control your carbohydrate intake. Can we just talk about that one in relation to, well, the standard American diet? So I would say that there's a few different things we should talk about. One is the standard American diet, which I would call the standard Australian and United Kingdom diet as well. We just we don't have as much fortify fortification in our foods in Australia, but I'd say that you know everyone's pretty much accustomed to eating packaged and processed food as a standard. You know, sixty to eighty percent of the population, not necessarily all the listeners here today. Um, but then also the food pyramid diet, which is kind of your more cereals based kind of diet. How would how do those two diets affect getting type two? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And uh, the standard American diet are sad as it's, it's known as, um, you know, I think can play a huge role because, you know, with, with America here, you mentioned maybe fortification, not being a, a huge part of overseas Australia, but it, it certainly is here, uh, huge fortified foods. And, you know, a lot of our food supply is, as you mentioned, coming from those processed food items. So as you can imagine, if a lot of those products are fortified, we're getting a ton of iron. And if you look at just something like, for example, cereal, you know, a lot of these cereals, one cup can t- contain almost like 12, 15 milligrams of iron. And we only need like about one milligram per day. So as you can imagine, that can really build up and we don't have this system, especially when it comes to iron to really excrete it other than females who have a menstrual cycle. So that's where, you know, things like blood donation can play a role, but that's, uh, that's another rabbit hole. But and when it comes to that that sad diet, that can, that can be one of the players is that um, not only just the the iron, the fortified, the processed food products, but the fact that they are uh, grains. So when it comes to this carbohydrate spectrum, having those details is important because there's a difference between something like a piece of fruit and uh, a piece of bread. There's a much difference, uh, much of a difference between what will happen and how that will impact your blood sugar. And what I find is working with clients, even, even myself, if I were to eat a piece of bread versus a piece of fruit, my blood sugar would spike a lot higher with that piece of bread than the piece of fruit. And the reason for that is because that piece of bread has hundred percent glucose, which is a, a carbohydrate that requires insulin to be absorbed. So for those of us who have an insulin deficiency, For those of us that are experiencing some form of insulin resistance, we know that pathway is disrupted, right? So the carbohydrates that rely on that pathway are ultimately going to be a little bit more difficult to tolerate. And that's why you see uh, those that are maybe struggling with carbohydrates to maybe struggle a little bit more with the grains. So the breads, the pasta, um, the rice, uh, any sort of processed cracker or pastry, those are going to be a little bit more difficult to tolerate because of those, that green proportion, that 100% glucose. And when you compare this to maybe like a piece of fruit or squash or root veggies that might have a little bit of what's called fructose, which is a carbohydrate that doesn't rely on insulin, uh, that can be a little bit more supportive to things like blood sugar balance because it's not affecting that insulin pathway. So um, things can stay a little bit more in balance with, with things like fructose. Now, the difference with the, the sad diet is a lot of this fructose, if you will, is coming from, you know, high fructose corn syrup, which is totally different, totally different. Isn't the, even close remotely the same as something like fructose from fruits. So the high fructose corn syrup is actually something that, uh, going back to the metformin, chelates copper. So it wastes copper, copper being a huge player with metabolism, huge player with blood sugar, that uh, that can create all sorts of issues in their food supply. I'm not sure what it's like there overseas, but um, at least in America here, that's a huge component of uh, you know, sodas uh, added to processed food products that, um, you know, just it plays a huge role in, in health, uh, health conditions these days. So that's another one. And, uh, you know, one other that makes like a huge difference too would be the unsaturated fats or just the vegetable oils that we use here today, especially with fast foods or patch, packaged uh, food products. Uh, just the amount of uh, omega-6s that are in our food supply 
ultimately lead to that per- lipid peroxidation when in excess and uh, can go into influencing a, a state of, of diabetes as well when continued chronically. So that can be quite another one to uh, consider and very significant. So that I guess the other thing to consider with the standard American diet, it's very low in protein, right? So to say, to say that the, high, the American diet is just high in sugar and fat is kind of just this blanket statement that isn't really looking at the context of everything because then people just go, well, sugar is bad and fat is bad. Mm-hmm. But it's also very low in protein and it's the types of sugar and fat that are being consumed, right? But can you talk about the protein part? Yep. Absolutely. And, and I think you're, you hit on a great point here that we'd label all carbs the same or all proteins the same or all fats the same. And they're, they certainly have different effects. And that's where understanding kind of the basics or more of the details there can be helpful because it gives us more context to them instead of just slapping a label that, hey, this is bad, we should avoid it. Right. So there, there is certainly a difference between those two. And as you hit on, um, and something that I didn't point out too, was the protein. And that's what I see all the time in in food logs is that people are constantly deficient in protein and are just not eating enough. And those carbohydrates or those fats might be higher, but we don't have enough protein to ultimately, um, sustain ourselves. And protein can be such a big player when it comes to uh, blood sugar balance too, and ultimately satisfying you long after the meal as well. And when we look at our food environment today, that's not a lot of the foods emphasized. And it's almost in a way a challenge for people to find uh, some protein or making sure that they're hitting their protein uh, to the point where they are ultimately supporting themselves because protein plays a huge role in blood sugar balance. It plays a huge role in digestion and ultimately stimulating something like hydrochloric acid where we can properly digest our food. So it's this crucial component that a lot of us are probably missing. And um, with at least here in America too, you know, a lot of it is emphasized our muscle meats, right? And uh, going back to the details of protein, we're probably not getting enough of a variety of proteins, you know, seafood, uh, liver, dairy, you know, et cetera. So, you know, with the, the meat being fully present there, it's looking at getting a variety because there with foods, there's mineral components associated with that too. Liver, you have vitamin A and copper, whereas something like beef, you wouldn't have those, that, that same extent of, of those mineral, that mineral balance. So we're missing out on a lot of those micronutrients in addition to what our food supply is in uh, relationship with kind of the the protein sources as well. So knowing kind of those nuances to that, as well as just making sure that you're getting enough can be helpful aspects to consider. And then you have that aspect of animals being grain fed versus grass fed, right? How does that affect our liver and blood sugar? Absolutely. And, and again, it, it's, it's going back to the, the details of it, right? You know, the quality of your food. And I always recommend to any client getting the best quality that you can, you can get because ultimately what uh, is fed to the animals ultimately ends up in that protein product as a result. So with uh, grain fed, that's going to be a little bit higher in iron that we mentioned is kind of this, um, this crucial point when it comes to insulin resistance and blood sugar stability versus a grass fed. It's going to be a little bit more supportive. It's not going to contain as much iron, particularly the liver products as well. If you look at something like grain fed liver versus grass fed, there's going to be a better balance when it comes to copper and iron versus something that is grain fed. So the, the foods that these animals are having is so important and uh, why sourcing the quality of your products really ends up mattering because those minerals end up in our food and we eat that food. So that becomes a part of ourselves as well. So getting that quality products and when it is grass fed, they're going to be a little bit more quality fats there too, because the cows are eating that nutrient rich grass, not the grain fed products, which make things a little bit more of a fat ear cut in my experience. So that can be a, another good area to consider what, where are you sourcing your foods from? Um, you know, can you get the best quality that you can get? Ultimately, I, I, I do recommend you know, getting non GMO organic as you can, but, um, understand each person kind of has a, 
uh, different budget and different lifestyle and what that looks like. But either way, looking at kind of the quality of what that food looks like can make a big difference in the progress that you do see. So the fats is really important. Let's talk about the fat. So obviously, like with eating a grass-fed animal, you're going to eat get vitamin E with that fat that's going to help with the poofer content. Let's talk about poofers because this is a big problem in the liver and blood sugar handling. And um, I think what can be also missed in a whole foods diet because some whole foods diets can actually be high in polyunsaturated fats, especially vegetarian diets. Can we talk? So people don't always think of bad fats and we have talked about this a bit on the show and there's a whole episode with Matt Blackburn um, on these healthy fats. I'm saying that in air quotes, but I'd really like you to get more specific in terms of diabetes. So we have everyone assumes that the trans fats are bad. So like your cooking oils and people generally know that, but then, And that's what is bad about the standard American diet. It's, you know, full of those kinds of fats and we become too high in those fats. So please explain that, but then also explain the poofers that are in health foods and how that affects our state with blood sugar and the liver. Yeah, yeah. So if there's there's certainly a difference between how fats ultimately impact us. And as you hit on it, those unsaturated fats can can be in, when in excess. And I, I'm not here to create any fear mongering by any means, but they're a little bit less supportive ultimately, especially, you know, if you're cooking things in vegetable oil, um, right? So they're a little bit more higher in omega-6. And those unsaturated fats are ultimately not the most supportive or where you want to get be getting the bulk of your fat sources because one, they're not rich in some of those uh, fat soluble vitamins that you mentioned. So the vitamin A, the vitamin E, especially, which are, are so crucial when it comes to any sort of health related goal there. So that that's that's number one. They're not really nutrient dense sources of fats. And, and number two, when they, especially when they are cooked or even before they even enter our body, they're very reactive fats. So they react to elements such as heat, light, oxygen. And even if you can imagine eating those and when it goes into your body, we're at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever that is in in Celsius. So we're very warm body um, species. And as a result, you know, those unsaturated fats can can really um, contribute to a lot of inflammation if they are in excess because of that instability. And the elements that we encounter either before we eat them or when we do consume them because our body is very warm, it's very oxygen rich, right? So that can be a a crucial thing to, to understand that they're just a little bit more unstable versus if you compare that to a saturated fat, they're not as, um, not as unstable. They're more of a stable fat. They don't react in the presence of heat and light and oxygen to the same degree. And in fact, melt. And when you, when you think about like a solid fat, I think this is one of the confusion points too. When you look at like a jar of coconut oil too, right? It's when it's cold out, it's like a solid and people think, think that, oh, that's going to clog my arteries because that's a solid fat, not understanding that that fat has a a certain melting point and it's not going to contribute to that clogging of arteries. What what really contributes to that is a level of inflammation and in in the body, which is uh, a whole other rabbit hole, but it's important to understand that that saturated fat doesn't stay solid when it enters your body. It doesn't that doesn't clog your arteries in that way, shape or form. So um, I think that can be kind of a a simple association, but just simply isn't true. So with those saturated fats, they can be more supportive because they're ultimately more stable and they don't contribute to that same inflammation, but at the same time, keeping them within balance, because we know um, when we're consuming too much fat, um, their ability to ultimately tolerate carbohydrates goes down. So while we need them, while they're a great source of fat soluble vitamins, particularly the saturated fats, keeping them within balance with the protein and the carbs um, that you're consuming throughout the day can make a great level of difference when it comes to the insulin resistance and just achieving the best blood sugar balance that you can. This, this is a big thing I think with, because now you're sort of explaining why the ketogenic diet, you know, it's another layer, like it's low carb, but it's also high in fat. Like it's not actually high in protein, it's high in fat. Same with the paleo diet, it's very high, hard to eat paleo without overeating fat. Um, 
but also a lot of people coming to the pro-metabolic space and like I took the list of foods from the pro-metabolic list and I'm eating all the foods and they've never logged before and they're putting on a lot of weight and they're still having a lot of blood sugar handling problems and thyroid problems and then they actually do a log and they're eating like 50% more fat and they're like, but it's good fat. I was told it was good fat and I'm not eating any poofers and, you know, it's that's really going to disrupt blood sugar handling as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And that's kind of going back to maybe your comment on the clean, clean eating, right? You're doing everything right. And it, it certainly might look like that. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I think there's a, just a different perspective when you start to create that awareness, as you said, and just the act of logging that and, and getting in tune with that, because we might believe one thing at the start, or we have, might have one thing in our mind, but when we actually really tune in, pay a t- little bit closer attention, monitor that clo- more closely, we start to understand that, oh, wait, I'm consuming a lot of fat here or, oh, wait, maybe I'm not eating enough protein here. So that can create such a level of awareness. It, the problem being that not, I don't know a lot of people that like logging, you know, it takes time. It, it, uh, it takes, um, you know, parts of your day out to, to do that and to dedicate to that. And it, for some people, it's hard to stay consistent with it, but there's such a, um, such a benefit on the back end of that, because if you use it correctly, it can really tell you where you need to go when it comes to those challenges that you are having. So when you have someone who is having blood sugar handling issues and diabetes symptoms and what, how much fat do you recommend? Yeah. Great question. I think it always goes for me. It always goes back to meeting the person where they are. So when it comes to someone who's, coming from me for like, um, you know, they're coming from like a ketogenic background and let's say they're super stressed and just aren't sleeping well. Well, for that person, I'm going to go really slow with them. I'm not going to introduce uh, quite as near carbs or quite as quickly as someone who's had more of that practice and been eating them for a period of time. Um, you know, if it's something, you know, like, um, the standard American diet, for example, they might be eating a little bit less fat than someone on keto. So they, they might be able to tolerate a little bit um, more carbs or maybe go a little bit more aggressively with that. So it it just kind of depends on the person, right? It's meeting them where they are. So I'm not sure if there's a certain percentage and the the way I, I start off with clients too, is, is more so on like a food and moods dialogue. So they really start to become aware of you know, what does that balance sort of look like for them? And not necessarily in the macro sense, but just in the sense of, Hey, am I having a a protein with this meal? Am I having a carb or a veggie with this meal? Am I having some sort of fat? And just that alone can really indicate a level of balance. Um, Where I see that high fat coming into play would be, you know, Um, where we consider healthy fats, right? Maybe they have something like a piece of toast in the morning and they put butter on that toast and then they cook their eggs in butter and have multiple eggs. And then, um, you know, maybe have uh, some sort of fried potato in butter so that all that fat tends to add up, even though if it's, you know, supportive fats, right? Uh, that would be a scenario would be like, Hey, maybe we can look at maybe some leaner options here, maybe a different way of cooking this, um, you know, maybe pairing the eggs with a leaner source of protein. So that's where I see those adjustments taking place. And of course, with maybe the more experienced person, maybe we would jump into macros, uh, of course, and, and maybe look at, you know, um, 25% calories fat, but That would be where I would start with first, not necessarily the macros, but just what does that meal balance look like for them in relationship to the carbs and protein and meeting that person where they're at? And I guess it's people not understanding that one gram of carbohydrate and one gram of protein is four calories, whereas one gram of fat is nine calories. So when you're talking about percentages and your meal, you can't really eyeball it because people kind of want to put everything on their plate and eyeball it. And, you know, because they've been taught that. And it, so it's like, oh, the fat's the smallest part, but it's actually nine times bigger than you think it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, it's it's double the calories, essentially. And, um, you know, I, I think that 
could play a role in, uh, in, in initial weight gain that you might have on this pro metabolic style, you know, whatever you want to call it style of eating in addition to maybe going too fast with the carbohydrates there, because we, we know fat, as you said, it's double the calories as something like carbs and protein. And some people might not be aware of that, that fact. Mm-hmm. And we're sort of like, we're not saying, Isaac and I aren't saying you have to focus on calories and it's all about calories, but mm-hmm. if you, you, you can't eat 3000 calories if you want. <laughs> so, you know, so some people are logging and for me and they'll come and like eating like 3000 calories. I'm like, well, that's why you, you put on weight. We can't eat an excess of calories. Um, but there are also people who are under eating too. Definitely. I would say most of my clients actually under eat as a whole. Um, yeah. So, and have, blood sugar handling issues do you want to touch on that a little bit because i think most people assume that when you go and see someone or they say you're overweight you need to just eat less right yep eat, eat less and move more right yeah that's the, that's the common <laughs> that's the common advice yep and uh you know that's i don't think that's doing uh people a disservice alt or it's not doing a people a, a service ultimately because there are uh, several factors, several contributors to blood sugar handling issues. And the more that uh, we strict, we, the more that uh, we don't eat or exercise more, that's ultimately not getting towards the problem because the problem is the inability to tolerate carbohydrates and ultimately improve that. And to some extent, if you have type one diabetes, you can improve that. But obviously we know there's an insulin issue there, but you know, for others, you know, there's things that we can do to ultimately improve upon that and increase our ability to improve that carbohydrate tolerance so that you can eat more, right? And uh, when it comes to eating less, we know if you're not eating enough to ultimately support that metabolism, uh, our ability to tolerate carbohydrates goes down, right? So there's, there's a piece of that, that we just think that what we eat influences our blood sugar. Well, we also know that when we're not eating in a way that supports our metabolism, that's a stress to the body. And what do we know about stress? We know stress increases insulin resistance, increases blood sugar. So that can be a way that if we're not eating in a way that's ultimately supportive, you might see a rise in that blood sugar. Just as Broda Barnes saw with his patients with uh, prediabetes when their thyroid wasn't up to par, right? Their blood sugar was a bit higher. So that can be one way that if you're not eating enough or not eating enough of the right supportive foods, ultimately in the balance that works for you, that that can be a way that if you are eating uh, less than what you should, that um, blood sugar can still be high for those reasons reasons mm, so it's really important to get that log right rather than just assume that someone has overweight so they must be eating too much yeah. um okay so let's talk about some of the big things that sugars so white sugar is white sugar bad for us mm-hmm. Yeah. And I always like to, to stray away from not necessarily labeling all foods like bad or good. You know, I think there's, there's supportive foods and maybe some that aren't as supportive, but um, I always like to kind of stray away from mongering or labeling things uh, with maybe the exception of vegetable oils. I'm not sure if that's, <laughs> that there's much benefit to that, but um, yeah, ultimately in, in moderation, I think white sugar can be a part of a, you know, balanced routine. Um, for someone like me with type one diabetes, that's one of the things that spikes blood sugar quickest. So obviously for someone like me, um, I need to be a little bit more cognizant of those carbohydrate choices, especially more of those refined. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't have them. I just have to have the right strategies in place to be able to support and things like insulin dosaging and techniques and like that um, can really be supportive to that. But in moderation, sure, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, there's there's a part of life of just enjoying it and and making sure that whatever journey, whatever style of eating that you're on, that is ultimately sustainable for you. And if white sugar makes that more enjoyable for you, all the power to you. Um, I think there are ultimately more supportive carb choices for the majority of your calories, but every now and then having, you know, sugar with your coffee or whatever, wherever that comes in that, if that helps it to, to stay sustainable for you, I'd say all, all the power to you. Um, it always goes back to, Hey, are you making progress? Are you enjoying it? And is this a sustainable way of eating that works for you? 
Mm. And I would say, I guess as well, as when you're looking at someone's logs, like I use chronometer, it's like, are you meeting all your minerals and micronutrients and everything else with your other carb sources? And so then you had a teaspoon of sugar here or there. That's okay. It's going to count to your overall carb content, but obviously sugar is an empty calorie, like if there's no minerals or, but if you're meeting all your minerals and it's like, okay, you can have a teaspoon of sugar here and there. It's not a big deal. I guess um, maybe you can elaborate more. And I think what's happened as well as people go, well, white sugar is bad. So in turn, I'm going to use all this honey and maple syrup and all these other sugar kind of things and some of them do have more minerals than white sugar yes for sure so you could consider them healthier but there's a problem with just switching from one sugar to the other sugar without understanding the contents of macronutrients right the yeah context. absolutely absolutely yep you hit on a, the the great a great point there Layla. the context of what is what does that look like for the person you know are they including um, you know, mineral dense, nutrient dense sources of foods throughout their day, you know, are they including fruits or root veggies or squash? Um, you know, are they including uh, nutrient dense proteins like liver, uh, beef or, um, you know, dairy, etc, you know, seafood? Uh, are they including supportive fats? So what is what is the context of the diet look like there for them? Um, and obviously not making it up the majority of the diet would ultimately be most optimal because the body runs on minerals that's like the foundation of, uh, of health in, in my opinion. And if we don't have that foundation in place, if we start incorporating all these nutrient, um, uh, you know, not dense, less, less nutrient dense sources of, of foods, so particularly carbohydrates that often just exacerbates some of the symptoms in my experience, just working with people. So ensuring you have some level of foundation, before, you know, incorporating a lot of that, those different food items that maybe are a little bit more emptier in terms of nutrients, I think can be helpful. And of course, context is, is super helpful there too. Yeah. Cause you don't want people to be paralyzed like by eating because sometimes like have making a chocolate milk before bed or having some ice cream, homemade ice cream before bed and having some white sugar in that when you've made or met all your other requirements for the day is actually fine. You know, no one get people to, I hate it when, like you say, food is fear mongered. So it's, it's like, you know, I have a four year old and all the parents around me are so afraid of giving their kids any sugar. And it's like, well, they can have a little bit of sugar if they have enough protein and they have enough uh, carbohydrate, you know, whole carbohydrates, like fruits and roots and having a little bit of sugar for ice cream is not such a bad thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's almost like that uh, pink elephant or that thing that you restrict often come back, comes back to haunt you in a way, because I, in my experience, the more that you restrict something, the more that you want it. So I think there's like a kind of a mindset uh, game with that too, is, is that, you know, if you place a lot of restrictions on yourself, what, what's the domino effect of that afterwards? Do you end up consuming even more than you would have liked to in, in the, the first place? And I find that to be the case too, when we do place those labels on food of, oh, this is bad. I shouldn't be eating this or restrict it fully. You know, what's the domino effect? You end up, you know, just binging out on that, right? Um, you know, later on. So uh, that's that's something that I've seen as well. So fructose is always deemed as bad as well. Let's talk a little bit about fructose. Sure. So we're going to go through all the myths around sugar here, everybody. <laughs> so white sugar in serious moderation <laughs> after you've eat, met all your other nutritional requirements. But then people have this belief that fruit is bad because it has fructose and or even potatoes like are on, you know, because they have fructose malabsorption or all these kinds of things. Let's talk about fructose. Yeah, yeah. Fructose is such a big area. And, and this was one of the more common questions that I I get on social media as well. And, and when it comes to, to fructose, and, and I think that one of the themes of, of our call here too, is just understanding that the differences between different carbohydrates or different proteins or different fats, those nuances, and instead of slapping a label on them, like all, all carbs are bad, right? So I think that's the same thing with, with fructose. There's a difference between high fructose corn syrup and uh, fructose from naturally occurring sources, whether that be you know fruits or squash or sweet potatoes or honey, for example. There's a difference between what that fructose does and also responds in the body. And for something like high fructose corn syrup, it's been shown for that that 
fructose is ultimately something that chelates copper. So it's something that uh, takes away a very crucial mineral when it comes to balancing blood sugar and uh, assisting with metabolism. So that right there, let alone other things, is one of the major factors when it comes to that difference. Also, you know, just through some research I was recently reading, they were talking about how a lot of the um, high fructose corn syrup uh, labels were actually incorrect, meaning that a lot of those labels should have been actually higher in carbs than what they showed. So that high fructose corn syrup might actually contain more calories than what's displayed on the label. Um, so that's something that I also um, seen in research as well. So that be another contributing factor that can go into that imbalance. But, you know, when you think about something like high fructose corn syrup versus fructose in fruits, there's a difference between that package too, right? You know, when you look at fruit, it has fiber, it has potassium, B vitamins, all these minerals and vitamins in there versus fructose uh, from, you know, soda, the high fructose corn syrup, it's contained in that uh, liquid form typically, or, you know, a, a package processed form that spikes your blood sugar up very, very quickly. So there's a difference with the, the packaging and those supportive attributes as a part of that food as well. And I think what's important always with food is like people people go, oh, well, I'm low in zinc or I'm low in iron. So what food has that in it, right, rather than understanding that you can't just take what you're lacking of because food actually works in combinations. Yeah, yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about, more about it's about combining macronutrients for blood sugar balance, not Absolutely. And for minerals as well. Yeah, each each of those plays a function. And I I spoke a lot about copper today, um, but, you know, what's what's needed when we, uh, you know, copper um, is obviously needed, but we need vitamin A as well to ultimately support this process where we can actually um, push copper into a a protein called ceruloplasm. And so we can actually use it. So vitamin A is a, a, a huge support with that. And when you look at something like liver, that's what liver has. So if we try to you know, necessarily uh, support ourselves with just like a copper supplement, for example, we're not necessarily getting that other nutrient that's a part of that. And that's why supplementation with individual nutrients like a vitamin C or uh, a zinc or a a copper or any other mineral that or vitamin that you want to think of, there's all these supportive nutrients on the back end that we might not quite understand that are ultimately important in being able to use that properly. So it's not just about copper, it's also about that vitamin A, right? Um, so that's that's a big player when it comes to, um, to, to minerals. And the same thing could be said for macronutrients because we know you know, the carbohydrates are obviously a big key when it comes to the impact that they have on blood sugar. But if you would pair your carbs with a protein, that lessens that effect. You don't get this huge spike, right? So it's not to say that, hey, carbs are bad. What's the, what's the context here? Are we consuming them alone? Are we drinking them in a liquid form? Or do we have them paired with some form of protein and fat that helps to stabilize that afterwards? So again, it's, it's what's the context here? And the more that we can kind of get that from a whole food source because nature really did it right. It's not extracting these isolated nutrients and saying, Hey, here's a supplement or here's this individual nutrient. It's saying, Hey, all these foods have a variety of different factors with them. They work together. Let's pair these together. So ultimately you get the most benefit from it. Can we also talk about food timing? Cause I think this is really important. Like it's not just when you, it's not what you eat, but it's also when you eat. And I think this is a huge thing in blood sugar handling. Cause often I'll see sometimes people just have it from accidentally fasting all the time or purposely fasting, especially some people who are overweight and have, have been told to fast. Can we talk about how important time is and blood sugar and why that kind of kicks fasting out of the park really? Yeah, absolutely. And, and timing is so, um, so important, especially when it comes to those, 
fasting numbers, which are ch- typically checked um, for for those of us with diabetes, is one of the more common ones. Blood sugar checks that are are, are um, checked for my clients too. So that's a big one. And when it comes to meal timing, typically what I see with clients is that they might be skipping meals early on in the day or just not feeling hungry. So they might not have a breakfast. They might have a small little lunch or maybe a snack here. And then by the time they get to dinner or that evening, they're extremely uh, hungry and starving and have this huge meal. And ultimately what ends up happening is, especially if you have more so that blood sugar challenge, their fastings will a little bit will be higher during the day. But that's not just to say that the end of the day is kind of this dysregulated process. We know when we're not eating breakfast or we're not eating those earlier meals, what ends up happening is it increases that insulin resistance that we talked about. So in, in that effect, I was just looking at the stu- a study too, um, that effect is um, makes its way across the whole entire day. So when you don't have a breakfast meal uh, later on in the evening, later on in the day, your blood sugar, or your insulin resistance is going to be a little bit higher as a result. So it's a day-wide effect. So that blood sugar, you know, the, the, um, the notion that it's the most important meal of the day is, is certainly true in that facet that that helps to kind of regulate blood sugar not only in the morning but also during the evening and when we're not, when we're not eating in the morning again that's increasing in the insulin resistance for those of us that maybe don't have diabetes it uh, can make our blood sugar drop a little bit lower there too so talking about that blood sugar balance making us feel more irritable more hangry um, and uh, the, the way that we eat ultimately influences the way that we feel and how we express ourselves too and how we show up so what ends up happening when we're not eating early enough in the day, uh, you have these dysregulated blood sugar all throughout the day, and that carries over to the next day as well. So looking at ways that you can kind of support yourself earlier on, as I see most commonly, can ultimately be a little bit more supportive, especially for those fasting numbers, because you're meeting your needs early on in the day and your body doesn't have to play catch up and have this huge meal at the end of the day to ultimately feel satisfied. Do you think also um, it has to do with density of food, blood sugar handling? Because I find this an interesting one. Like I'm Asian and I could eat anything for breakfast. The thought of eating cereal for breakfast does not appeal to me at all. I'm actually not someone that does that well on grain. If I had cereal for breakfast, I would be hungry half an hour later. Can we talk a little bit about food density and how that plays into diabetes and blood sugar? Absolutely. And this is a huge emphasis of mine too. I've made uh, quite a few posts on on this on my social media channels as well, because there's a nuance to this, right? There's a, a difference between different types of carbs and proteins that ultimately can be on the lighter side of things or on the denser side of things. And that can go into how long a certain meal might satisfy you. So for example, a lighter choice might be something that you touched on, the cereal, um, and maybe you put some level of milk in there, but that's, you know, it has all the macronutrients, right? It has the protein with the milk, it has some fat there, it has some carbs, but it's ultimately going to be very light. It's not going to satisfy you. You're going to be hungry maybe an hour or two after that, right? Versus if you look at something that also includes all the macronutrients, so maybe it's something like butternut squash and a few eggs, right? So you have eggs with the protein and fat, you have butternut squash with the carbs, but it's denser. It has that fiber. It's something that carries you over, satisfies you for uh, maybe three hours, four hours, right? So that's a dense meal. It's something that will hold you over. It's slower acting, meaning that when you eat that particular meal, that blood sugar is going to slowly rise and slowly fall versus the lighter options like the cereal that are quick, easy to digest, maybe more processed. It's going to spike blood sugar up and it's going to drop back down or stay elevated. So there's a difference between the different types of macronutrients and the density can play a huge role, not only in appetite, but also where your blood sugar ends up at the end of the day. So this is 
this is like a, a huge principle that I talk about with clients because a lot of times they are eating those lighter meals, especially early on in the day, and ultimately can help to or can hinder them at night because it leads to them just feeling starving and having eating a bunch of food at the end of the day, right? Um, and uh, when it comes to kind of that the weight gain or you know keeping the the balance or calories in check, that can be a, another one that can ultimately be supportive to that is eating more of those dense choices, especially if, if weight loss is ultimately a goal. And I think it's going to change too with your workouts, right? Like I notice I've been playing around with different food combinations now that I'm putting quite a significant amount of my energy into strength training and what I need to eat in the morning. I actually need to eat twice before I strength train, sometimes three times. And I think that's really interesting because so many people will go to training on an empty stomach. I am lucky I work for myself so I can choose to work out in mid-morning, you know, early afternoon. So that's a factor as well. But I notice that I have to eat like at least two or three times before I train and I also have to eat quite a lot of and muscle meat. And then later in the day I can pull back on the muscle lead and eat meat more kind of carb kind of focused meals. It's really interesting to me. So I have been experimenting lately with porridge after my workout and I do put egg whites in my porridge and casein powder so it's still a high density and not high density high protein porridge low density but after a workout you really want to quickly uptake the carbohydrate right to replenish muscle glycogen so that's when that work meal works for me and also knowing that I'm going to eat dinner two hours later or lunch two hours later so it's 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 so important to log and see how you respond to different foods and the different timings of food. And it's not to say that you can never eat them because I never would have thought that I'd be able to eat a cereal again, but the, the, the oats after training, it's actually working really well for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's a big, big uh, component here because it's not to say that light foods are bad. It's to say there's a certain context to them and how you use them ultimately matters the most. And as you mentioned, having that quick absorbing, you know, our quick, you know, meal after post-workout can ultimately be supportive to refilling that glycogen or, you know, especially if you have maybe a muscle building goal, for example, of getting those uh, nutrients in there quickly. So there's, there's certainly a time and place for, for everything, I believe. Yeah. yeah. I don't think I could eat it if I wasn't training. Mm -hmm. I tried it on a non-training day and it's just not the same. It's just, just like straight after a workout, it's like the perfect time for me to have that high carb kind of meal it's interesting yeah so so yeah so restoring metabolic function i guess that's the key thing here right with diabetes and what we talk about so much on the show so i hope you guys are okay with that but that comes down to balancing macronutrients looking at your meal timing um to balance blood sugar how can you talk a little bit about using temperature and pulse and how you would use that to look at blood sugar or tie in with your glucose monitoring that you're doing for the type ones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is this is a measurement that I use for some clients, not not all, but especially for those that are, you know, ha having issues with uh, thyroid health or have been really shown to. Um, to struggle with blood sugar balance um, because depending on the client, it's, it's a lot to log like their blood sugars and their temperature and pulses. So that's, it's a lot of data that they're kind of throwing around. So I, I take it, you know, for each person a little bit differently, but if, if there was going to be a client that I used it for um, you know, that can be a, a good way to monitor things, especially I have them, you know, if they are monitoring blood sugar, maybe take a fasting, but for the rest of the day doing uh, body temperature and pulse. And that can be a great measure of where your, your metabolism ultimately stands there for you and how those individual meals are ultimately either supporting or maybe not supporting you. And ultimately you're wanting both of those to an extent rise after meals. And that goes to show that, hey, that meal was probably supportive for you, um, provided the balance, the energy that you needed to, for that specific meal, right? So that's what I would kind of look at. I, I like to look at that maybe right when they wake up. So um, immediately kind of waking up like 20 to 30 minutes after breakfast and then after after lunch there as well, just to see how that morning time is going there for them. 
And when it comes to metabolism and those measures, it can be a great function because when those are in place, typically that means that a blood sugar is also in place because we know from a domino perspective that when we uh, regulate the metabolism, regulate the thyroid, that that down, down the line plays a role in our ability to manage blood sugar as well. So the two are connected. And that's the reason why monitoring those temps and pulse can ultimately be supportive, not only to that, but just to make sure those, those meals are ultimately working for you and you're, you're feeling good as a, as a result. I don't use blood glucose to measure my clients. I'm interested, you know, it's not in my bucket of experience. Um, do you find that measures well with temper pulse? Is there like, do they differ? Like, do you use them together? Like, obviously I use temper pulse, but I'm interested in how the blood sugar thing works. Yeah. Uh, for the right person, I do use them together, especially if they have a history. Cause I have one client that I'm thinking of kind of has like prediabetes and also has uh, Hashimoto's as well. So for her, we, um, she likes to, to monitor like their fasting numbers, um, and, and kind of see where those lie for her. And ultimately when I do see them a bit higher is when those temperature and pulses typically aren't within range. So kind of going back to what Broda Barnes was, was saying that when he had those pre-diabetes patients whose blood sugar was elevated and when they put put them on thyroid that those numbers reduced and got in range i'm i'm seeing similar trends where their blood sugar might be higher in the morning and their temps and pulses might be out of range or not moving up after meals so ultimately those meals not necessarily supporting them so that is one way that i've I've used it before. Yeah. Mm, it's interesting that way too, because when you think about it, like I work with a lot of people with thyroid dysfunction and a lot of them can, and like myself can have a normal looking thyroid panel, but then have these extreme blood sugar handling issues. And I've had extreme blood sugar handling issues my entire life. <laughs> so, and then, so they're told that they don't need a thyroid supplement but they do need to go on metformin or something or, but actually if they take a thyroid supplement, then they don't need the blood sugar treatment provided that they have met their metabolic needs with their food and timed their food and all of that stuff as well. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that you're seeing that as well with, with clients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And you know, for, for, uh, I would say a good majority, we're able to do that through lifestyle, but there are some occasional individuals that, as you said, might benefit from the looking at their doctor and seeing if they can get a, a thyroid uh, um, uh, uh, prescription for that as well. So to kind of support them, but uh, yes, for the, for the most part, I see the, you being able to regulate that through lifestyle and through that food frequency and ultimately making sure that those meals are dense enough or, um, you know, ultimately to sustain you in a way. hundred yeah. percent. Do Are you using any other um, interventions with clients for helping with that liver, liver function and blood sugar balance, like aspirin and anything like that? Yeah, I mean, that's something I experimented with myself, but, um, you know, that's, it's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, I would say, like things like the aspirin, um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure of its viability. I mean, I'd love to hear perspective of other, other coaches in that area, but I haven't personally used it with, with clients there before. And, 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 and my view, and this is just my opinion, it's almost like an after effect. Mm -hmm. Like if we were to just kind of address the root of the problem, you know, the unsaturated fats or the iron piece of it and looking at how, how we can best regulate those that would take care of the things that aspirin is ultimately beneficial for. So that's, that's how I kind of view it. I don't have like a ton of experience with, um, with aspirin. I, I did experiment with it, you know, years ago, but, uh, just don't have a lot to go off of. And that's something that I've, I've definitely necessarily done with clients. Yeah. Mm, that's something, I think it's more probably something to uh, speak to Tomo about, you know, who has his master's yeah. and PhD in endocrinology and is familiar more with medications and things like that. So like Georgie, he's going to be on the show next week. So there are applications, but I guess what I'm saying is as well is that often I'll go, I'll see people and they're taking like all of these things <laughs> to clean their liver because they've read on the Ray Pete forum 
or some other kind of forum or anything or it's like, oh, niacinamide is really good for cleaning out your liver or taurine or whatever, and um, I have diabetes and I should take that. And people message me on Instagram all the time. I have this problem and I saw Matt Blackburn taking all this stuff. Should I take all this stuff? Um, And for the most, for a lot of people, you can get better just doing food properly. And I think really healing from this stuff is actually moving away from having to take something all the time to fix something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm a firm believer in in food first, if we can do solve it through that. And I think supplements are such a, a rabbit hole these days with all the different things out there. And I used to be one of those people that would take, you know, 20, 30 or whatever different supplements at one particular time. And I think that's the case with a lot of clients that I'm getting, they're on so many different things. And I'd imagine that would lead to a level of, you know, confusion or frustration or just um, maybe a you know, lack of awareness awareness of, Hey, what, what does that do for me? Is that helping? Is that hurting? You know, there's a lot of different variables when you have so many supplements on board as far as, Hey, is this actually helping me at the end of the day? And, and that's what I kind of take the stance of, Hey, you know, less, less is more here. And if we can do it through fruit food, ultimately that's going to be in my experience, the most supportive and where I see uh, clients really progressing the most, because again, supplements are kind of this isolated form of a nutrient. And through nature, we have these supportive cofactors like the vitamin A, for example, that are helpful in us being able to actually use that copper that we that we speak about. So those are the those cofactors, I think, in, in my opinion, are things that we kind of miss out on sometimes if we're not aware of that. 100%. The only thing we didn't talk about, which we need to talk about, is cholesterol mm-hmm. and diabetes because... I see, and personally for myself, so for those who know or follow me or whatever, I did a mold detox and one of the binders in the mold is actually cholesterol lowering. And so it really messed around with my ability to metabolize fat and it really messed around with my insulin receptivity and also my leptin. Um, So that's the reason why I put on a huge amount of weight when I was eating nothing. So um, can we talk about cholesterol and the relationship to, and probably I guess about statins because it is pretty, I can't remember what the percentage is, but it is highly likely if you take some kind of cholesterol lowering medication that you will end up taking something like metformin. So let's just talk a little bit about the cholesterol and the blood sugar and diabetes issue. Yeah, absolutely. Cholesterol is a, is a definitely a big thing. And it often goes, like you said, hand in hand with the blood sugar imbalances as well. So with, with cholesterol, we know it's, it's a good thing. It's something that ultimately is the backbone for a lot of our steroidal hormones. So it's, it's not bad as people make it out to be the, 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 the thing that is ultimately quote unquote bad is if, you know, you have these high cholesterol levels and then you enter in inflammation. So you're taking in a bunch of iron or have a lot of iron stored away, or you're consuming or have consumed a lot of unsaturated fats and that inflammatory process changes cholesterol. And that byproduct called oxysterols can be lodged in the, um, the, also the walls of the art- arteries there. So that that's can, when it can be, um, you know, uh, something that is a little bit more concerning, but it's not the cholesterol that is really doing that. It's more so the inflammation and inflammation in the arteries that is, is the, are those contributing factors ultimately. But um, cholesterol is this important piece because it is the backbone of hormones. And if we don't have that, if we're just simply taking a statin, we're essentially blocking that. And that's where, in, in my experience, clients might have some hormonal imbalance issues because that cholesterol is such an important piece to uh, ultimately feeling your best, right? So when it is elevated, ultimately, people are going to have some hormonal imbalance issues because 
that is that primary substrate that we take to also we push that into those hormones, right? So it's it's all about that conversion and things that help with those conversion is ultimately a way of eating that supports your metabolism. And Broda Barnes proved this as well as thyroid function increases, so does your ability to utilize that cholesterol, right? So that that's an important piece. And then you have minerals like uh, vitamin C and magnesium and uh, copper that are crucial in being able to assist with that process, kind of like those cofactors that we, we discussed there before, right? And if you were to simply address this by taking a statin, as, as you mentioned, there's association with decreased glucose or carbohydrate tolerance upon taking a statin. So there's a lot of individuals that have become of an increased risk when they do take some form of a statin after the fact for something like type two diabetes because of, of that nature of the statin. So that would be kind of important to understand that there, there are some risks on the back end. And if you can do something beforehand, whether that's working on metabolism or those mineral balance pieces, um, as well as things like stress, because we know stress raises cholesterol too. If you can kind of work on those pieces, that might play a big role when it comes to ultimately supporting that cholesterol. So you can get it back to a range that works and um, is able to be converted and um, diverted to more of those steroid hormones. So what about autoimmune disease? Because this is a big one because type 1 is an autoimmune disease. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease, which it, as far as medical people will say will often lead to type 1 diabetes. We're told so often to cut out sugar for autoimmune because it elevates the immune response. Can you talk a little bit about antibodies? And it's interesting, right, because I have had my antibodies for Hashimoto's in the 300s. And then restoring metabolic function, having them back down to zero. And I eat sugar and carbohydrates. <laughs> so can we just talk about this autoimmune aspect? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's funny how that works. So we, we envision one thing happening, but when you actually do it in a way that's supportive, as you mentioned, seeing those antibodies uh, reduce. So that's, that's great that you're able to see that success with that. And ultimately with the uh, immune system eating in a way that's ultimately supportive is, is something that regulates the, the levels ultimately, because I, I think the one, the one trap that I think uh, some people kind of fall into is, Hey, I'm going to eat this way for PCOS. I'm going to eat this way for type one diabetes. I'm going to eat this way for type two. And, you know, there, there are certain nuances. Sure. But, you know, when you support the body, you support the body, right? And, you know, it's, it's kind of as, as simple as that. And as you mentioned, you found that thing that works for you. And when it comes to immune health, it's, it's, I mean, there's, there's certain nuances to it, but when you ultimately eat in a way that's supporting yourself, you're feeling well, your biofeedback, things like energy, digestion, mood, sleep, stress are all in range are all feeling better. Ultimately, that's going to go a long way into supporting immune health too. So there's not necessarily anything that I would maybe pinpoint as that, Hey, this is the one thing that's going to support your immune health. It's just ultimately eating in a way, living, breathing in a way that are ultimately going to support you at the end of the day. And part of that is creating that awareness around, as you mentioned, logging of, Hey, what is that lifestyle? What does that food look like for me right now? In my opinion, when it comes to immune health, it's all starts with the blood sugar balance. It all starts with that food frequency and developing that and balancing that blood sugar because uh, we know when that is in, in play, it makes it so much easier to sleep well. It makes it so much easier to have the energy to move in the way that you'd like to ultimately. And it makes it so much easier to, um, to handle stress, right? So that's where, that's where I kind of view it from a sense of maybe not anything specific as in, hey, what supports this particular thing um, specifically, but more so eating in a way that's supportive, living in a way that's supportive, that ultimately help to balance that uh, immune system, right? So that's, that's what I would kind of look at. And of course, you know, things like, um, especially when you look at type one diabetes being an autoimmune condition, you know, the immune system is not going 
like um, all hectic and all and creating all this chaos for nothing. You know, the body doesn't operate like that and doesn't uh, just all of a sudden create these autoimmune conditions. There's a reason for that. And the reason is, you know, for these autoimmune conditions there are these dysfunctional cells that uh, maybe contain you know, a lot more iron or just aren't able to keep up or retain the metabolism due to that excess iron or lack of copper or, or lack of magnesium, right? So it's autoimmune conditions or immune conditions in general aren't this immune system issue that the immune system is bad. It's looking at what are those pieces that are allowing the immune system to respond in that way. So I think you've done amazing today. I think uh, what really resonates with me, though, and I think what people like about following me so much is that we've had an experience and we've used food to recover from that experience. But the question that people always come up with when they sort of are unpacking their story, because everybody wants it to be one thing, right? There was one thing that made me sick. And if I could just fix that one thing, then everything would be good. But it's never one thing. (laughs) It's an accumulation of many things. And so I think for a lot of clients, there's this point where you have to go, not have to, but a lot of people will go, oh, shit, I did this to myself. Or I, you know, and, and obviously you, you can't control if you had, you grew up in a stressful environment like I did with, you know, a lot of abuse and trauma and stuff going on. That's going to elevate your stress response and can be the start of this cascade of things. But do you look back and say, oh, shit, I did this to myself? You know, how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that? You know, because now you're taking insulin forever, like, mm-hmm. and you lost your identity as an athlete. How did you go through the process of, you know, what does that feel like? What what was your self talk like, and how did you get to how you where you are now? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question, and I think that's that's hard to cope with when you have that realization that oh, man, I I probably did some things here that probably led to where I am, am here today. And, you know, that takes a certain level of ownership and a a certain level of awareness to be able to do that because it is easy to blame external circumstances or genetics or whatever might be the case for you on on that particular thing. And of of course, those are certain variables. You know, I I certainly don't want to discount that, but there also is a certain ownership that you need to take for the the things that might have contributed to that. And that's the power of reflection. That's the power of logging or creating that awareness for yourself or working with somebody who has been there or can guide you through that process based on what they they see there as well. And for for, for me, there there was a lot of negative self-talk because I, I think, and, and this is something that my clients really related to too, is that when you when you get diagnosed with something, there is a lot of self-blame. And for me, there was, especially with my type one diagnosis, like, wow, what did I do here? What did I do to cause this? And um, that's that's hard to cope with. But you know, the, the way I always approach things, especially if it's in a negative sort of light is looking at what's, what's the flip side here. What can I do that is ultimately going to make the best out of this situation? What can I learn from this? And as I start to reflect and work with, you know, people like Josh and connect with great people like you, it's like, they, there are certain things that I didn't just didn't do in the past or was overlooking or was not supporting in my Sorting my uh, supporting myself in a way that was healthy, and I can certainly ad- admit to that. But what I've learned is I can take that experience, I can learn from it, and I can pass it on to others that might be in that very same situation, so I can maybe better support them. So maybe they don't have to go through something like I did before, right? So I think that's what I kind of take gratification with is that I can take my experience and I can share that with others. And hopefully to some extent that helps them out, go through that, uh, that tougher period of time, because when it comes to 
maybe the things that you felt like you did wrong, you know, if you knew better, you would do better. And, you know, once you, you do learn some things and, and, you know, advocate for yourself and get out there and look into educated people like yourself, Layla, I, I think you, you start to put those pieces together. So I, I think that you know, taking away a little bit of that self flame and, and understanding that, Hey, you know, if you, you only do the best that you can with the resources that you have. And, and that's what I did, but you know, at the same time, learning from that, what can you take away from that as well? So that's, that's how I personally have approached it. And I think as well, like the medical industry, like I'm sure when you got diagnosed with type one, they would have given you like the food pyramid and said, you need to eat a certain amount of grain product (laughs) as your carbohydrate. So they would say, well, you, you need to balance your blood sugar with protein, fats and carbs, but they would, they're telling you the wrong carbs to eat. So you, you get a diagnosis and there isn't the right support there to help you with that diagnosis. So we don't have any other choice really except to go on this journey to discover. And we also, I think, need to have patience with the fact that the, the industry, so you go from medicine, you go, well, I don't want to do that because that doesn't sound right, but then you go into wellness and it can just be as the same as allopathic medicine where we just keep taking a supplement for each ailment that we have. And then we can go, well, I could go then I could try the dietary route where I give up sugar or I, you know, you, by the time you get to this place where you're like on a path where you feel like you're getting better, you've tried so many things. And I think it's having patience for the fact that there's just an overwhelm of information and we're not taught the simple basic things at school, you know. Yeah. Like I'm still surprised how many children don't know that a potato chip is made from a potato and what a potato looks like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can only go as far as our best support. And uh, when it's not maybe up to par or where um, we maybe need it to be, again, that that's where the advocating for yourself can be such an important thing. So it, it's good to have maybe some level of support there. But I always recommend, you know, taking that with a grain of salt, making sure that you're doing your due deal due diligence aligning with professionals that you feel would, would be supportive to you in, in your journey and always continue to learn having that open mindset and uh, understanding those basics can kind of go a long way in reducing some of that overwhelming, reducing some of that confusion. So that's where I always recommend starting um, looking at and honing in on those basics because as, as you said, you know that those are not so you know common anymore. And I think it's also more and more regular that it's happening that it's actually like a stressful event that's or, a, you know, a burnout kind of scenario where people are having these situations as well. So and taking responsibility or owning that you pushed yourself too hard and you didn't stop and rest enough, that's a hard one in a society that's all about pushing yourself to the nth degree, you know, academic achievements, financial achievements, not oh, I ate all of my food today and I, you know, that's not an achievement. So I'm so grateful that you came onto the show, Isaac. I know there are going to be people listening who would love to work with you. How can they find you? How can they get in touch with you? What kind of programs do you offer? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my main uh, source of content that I, um, or my main channel rather, is my Instagram uh, channel. It's just my, my name, Isaac Pullman, Isaac Pullman. So you can look me up there. Uh, I also have a website, www isaacpullman.com, where you can download a, a free um, insulin resistance report. Actually, I did a whole report on that. So feel free to download that. There's also a link on my website where you can click on to work with me as well. There's a you know, short little application there. So I have a, a few different programs or options that you can choose from. It's called the Balanced Blood Sugar Roadmap. So very on theme for today. And, um, you know, have, uh, you know, a few different options there to, to choose from. So um, I, to get clients on the call, I also often do like a, dis- a short discovery call just to learn about more about them and seeing if I can help. So feel free if you're interested or, or uh, want to look further into some guidance around blood sugar balance, um, feel free to schedule a call there. Uh, and you have a book coming back out? I do. I do. It's in the process of being edited. I have most of the content uh, finished, but it's just a matter of putting it together. I'm sending it off to an editor. So hoping to have that done around June, June 1st or so. 
Make sure you're on Isaac's Instagram or his mailing list so you know that when that book comes out, because um, I know there's going to be a lot of you listening going, oh, my God, I have blood sugar handling issues, even if you're not diabetic or I'm pre-diabetic or those kinds of things. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Isaac. I've really enjoyed this chat with you and thank you for all the information that you've brought for our guests today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for the invite, Layla. It was, it was fun to be on with you. I'm Layla Lutz and you've been listening to The Body Never Lies. If you haven't yet, please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe rate and review this podcast. All the resources and references from this episode are waiting for you on my website, leelalutz.com. Just click on podcast and look for this episode. Now join me next week for another episode of The Body Never Lies. Thank you so much for listening.